Hi everybody, this is Toffee bringing you the last segment of my Fire Emblem 9 Hard Mode 100% Growth LTC. We're entering the late game, which is going to be all about making good use of the rescue staff and siege tomes, and I have a lot of turn saves to show off. Right away, we have Chapter 21, a seize map, which most LTCs have 4 turns with 1 rescue use, but we are going to be a bit more aggressive and go for a 3 turn with 2 rescue uses. We have more money than we know what to do with at this point, so we forge a Max Might Lightning Tome for Riss. We also use an Occult Scroll to teach Ike Ether. We didn't bother teaching anybody else mastery skills because the most of the classes we're using have terrible masteries. Ether and Ike won't actually prop much in practice because of combat rigging, but it we might as well teach it. It technically is improving the reliability. We will also teach Marum Smite as our next heaviest Lagoose behind Mordecai. Almost hand in hand with the rescue stuff, we're going to see a heavy focus on shove in the late game since we're going to be using plenty of foot units and racing, of course. Uh, Ether on Ike will also enable feeding him some EXP on a later map because between Ether and Killing Edge crits, he can pull. Uh, he can have a respectable chance of one running enemies while still not uh, cleanly one running them in the combat forecast, which will convince them to go for him. But that's on a later map, we can talk about it when that happens. As previously discussed, Riss is going to be our primary rescue user, and on turn 1 we need to get Marsha to fly him across some water to take the shortest path to the throne area. We use a couple of mounted units to ship Riss to the front, since we want to give the better starting slots to other units. Racing needs to be boosted a total of 7 squares, but we need to be very particular about the order and th the directions in which we shove him to ensure we don't accidentally push him into a wall. She needs to dance for Marcia at the very edge of her movement range starting from the best starting spot so that she can just get onto land and drop this. You'll notice that unlike other LTCs, Marsha flew close to that pack of enemies. That's because for this 3 turn clear, we actually need Racer to transform on turn 3, and that will require him to get attacked a lot, which we can achieve on turn 1 with the help of that enemy squad. I will rescue Tarmod in preparation for turn 2. Marsha needed to get onto that square in order to drop Riss. If she was one square to the right, she would not actually be able to drop Riss to the left because of how Telly treats boundaries. The only practical reason we forged that lightning tome for Riss is to let him one round this sage. I looked into the possibility of three turning this map with only one rescue use, but I couldn't make it work, and it also wouldn't work with the Hamburn timings. The third and final Master Seal is on this map, in a treasure room to the south of where Marcia and Riss are, but we don't have the time to get to it. We wouldn't really have any units who would want to use it, as you'll see soon enough. Only one of the Halberdiers has 2 range, and so Riss will get attacked a total of 4 rather than 5 times on this enemy phase. In turn 2, we need to get Ike close to the left wall to be within Riss's rescue range, so we use the shove bots we deployed. Uh, we deployed for Raisin earlier to start shoving Ike to the left. I thought we could have redone some of my actions on this map to not have as much lag between them. But, you know, I knew I was 
pretty much at the end of the run. So I just wanted to get it over with so I could publish it and show off all the cool strategies I came up with. Riss first rescues Raisin since we need him on the left on both turn 2 and turn 3. Riss will be immediately danced so he can rescue Ike carrying Tarmon very far forward. Marsha will rescue Raisin forward to get him closer to where he'll be needed on turn 3. There is a recruitable unit on this map, Toronio the General. He has the result skill but his combat isn't relevant to this run. Ike recruits him by talking to him, which will let Toronio take drop Raisin. Toronio will also bait the sleep bishop near the throne to move out of the way since he'll target him, uh, since he has the lowest resistance of all the units we have on the left thanks to 100% growths. As for the enemies who attack Raisin on turn 1, they will constitute an EXP feast for Jill, who definitely would like to grow her stats a little bit more for a particular route map that is coming up. Ike of course is carrying Tarmod in order to ship an extra unit over to the left, and Tarmod is going to have the job of killing the boss. Ike has just about good enough stats to two-shot most of the enemies nearby with the Sonic Sword, and that will convince them to go for Tarmod due to his lower bulk. Which is nice. Tarmod definitely wants the EXP. This is a rather long enemy phase, isn't it? Jill is just one level away from capping her most relevant combat stats. It doesn't double the Swordmaster, but that's okay. Risk can kill him for the uh, Risk can kill him on the next turn. As a side note, last time I said that there was only one four-way dance in the entire LTC. Uh, I was incorrect about that. We are actually going to see a four-way dance on turn three. Raisin transforms right on Q. We needed 
Raisin's uh, multi-way dance on this turn. In order to boost Ike and Tarmod a few extra squares. So Ike can so Tarmod can kill the boss and Ike can seize. The boss Enna is ridiculously bulky. She basically has the stats that she is going to have when she joins us uh, a little bit later in the game. With the only caveat being her demi band slightly reducing her stats. As such, Tarmod needs to use a forged Thunder Tome in order to kill her with a crit plus hit. And we also have to anti rig uh, her proccing Miracle, which she has a 14% rate of proccing. And in this game, Miracle, if it procs, will just ensure that you survive the attack no matter what. We break Ward here, but we also have no need for it going forward. We'll just clean up and that'll be chapter 21 in 3 turns with 2 rescue uses. Chapter 22 is a nice little breather map. It's a kill boss, and the gimmick is that the boss is using a number of priests as hostages. There is a bonus EXP objective for sparing all the priests, which we will be able to achieve since we have access to siege equipment to snipe the boss with. We forge an extra javelin, but I don't think it was ever really necessary. There is a bolting drop by an enemy sage that is an important side objective, but otherwise we just deploy a bunch of units to farm EXP. To get to the Sage of Drops Bolting, we do need to shove this one Priest, so we can hit the Sage from 2 range. From saving all the Priests, we also get the S rank staff the Ashera. Uh, Riss actually will be able to use it though we won't be using it in this LTC. Nomad will delete the boss with the Meteor Crit to finish the map in one turn. I'll meet you back at the start of the next chapter.
Chapter 23 is another seas map, commonly called Pitfall Bridge by fans. We need to cross a giant bridge filled with pitfall traps, but we're mostly gonna fly through it. Most prior LTCs have 3 turned this map, but we are once more gonna be aggressive and 2 turned this map with 2 rescue uses by taking a cue from the individual chapter LTC. The seas point is 38 squares through the air from the best starting spot for a flyer. This means Marcia with 3 full moves plus 3 squares can reach 2 range of the boss to kill her. She obviously cannot then drop Ike in C's range herself, so we will have her carry a rescue user, Riss of course, who will help get Ike to the front. Riss will also need to boost Raisin forward on turn 1. Thankfully, we get the Hermann staff from a base conversation so we can repair the rescue staff, and there is a safe path for Riss to take that will ensure he does not fall into a trap. We forged a Max Might Max Crit Silver Lance to kill one specific boss later. We dump some bonus EXP and stat boosters on Raisin since this map will see him face by far the most attacks in a single enemy face in any of our clears. Giving Raisin the speed wings is part of what put me in a pickle at the very end of the game, but we'll talk about that when we get there. We would have needed to also deprive Jill of the speed wings to really take advantage of it though. We're joined by Ranulf, another cat lagoose. He starts off maps with his gauge half full and he actually has the weight to shove Marcia even when he's untransformed. Mr. spent long enough self-improving and finally contributes to the run by using Hermann to repair rescue, since Riss is too busy to do it himself. We need to boost Riss 4 squares so he can rescue race into that particular square. This gets Riss to A rank, which means he can use Nosferatu. Karmad will use his 8 move and access to Siege to snipe a specific mage who drops his blizzard to grow our collection of siege equipment. He uses the drop to convoy warp away the meteor so he can fight on enemy phase. Jill was deployed and is hanging back at the starting area because there is a recruitable unit who will show up once we cross all the reinforcement zone lines on this map. In an incomplete recruitment run, we'd obviously have to skip this unit since only Jill can recruit him. This clear definitely would not work without combat rigging. Raisin is going to get attacked so many times he will actually transform on turn 1 enemy phase. This map is another great application for Shade. Riss needs to cap out his staff range for next turn, and Shade ensures the enemies will pretty much all go for him, letting him farm tons of EXP and also weapon rank for a little flex. I believe only one of the Feral Lagoos will end up attacking Marcia because of the whole thing where Feral Lagoos seem to mostly ignore Shade. I wouldn't be surprised if the full guard was also helping funnel the bow using enemies to attack Riss. I 
And with that risk caps out his staff range. Riss actually has the skill capacity that we could have taught him the mastery skill for bishops, which is Flare. Flare is a proc skill that cuts the enemy's resistance in half. But given that most of the enemy's Riss fights are physical, he isn't really going to benefit from it. And the few magical enemies he fights, we can ensure that his tomes are strong enough to let him just punch through them. That crit from Marsha was unnecessary, but the place where I had frozen the RNs just had it. Turn 2, we recruit Har. Har is a Wyvern Lord with OK base stats who comes with the Guard skill. We'll deploy him on one map to kill one enemy to simplify the clear. In turn 2, we shove Ike a bunch of times, since we need to get him within Riss's staff range to complete the 2 turn clear. Mon and Ike need to break Raisin out of the cage he's stuck in. And unfortunately, I couldn't see a way to do it that didn't involve burning one siege tome use. Marsha can just barely kill the boss with 
a crit plus hit. And we get the flame lands for our troubles. If we use Sorn as our rescue staffer, the 1 extra square of staff range would let Ike avoid using the Sonic Sword here. But it's all good, we have more than enough Sonic Sword uses to last us for the rest of the game. And Gris pulls Ike from the very edge of his staff range, and he will seize to complete chapter 23 in two turns with two rescue uses. We've been really trigger happy with our rescue staff, haven't we? There are multiple ways to optimize maps in the presence of movement staves. You can either directly save turns with them, or you can reduce the number of staff uses for clears with a particular turn count. Chapter 24 is an arrive map that we will of course have Marcia clear the main objective of. Cheeky originally two-turned this map with three rescue uses in his hard mode run, which Typhoon Carter also did. Later, Cheeky figured out a two-turn of this map with only two rescue uses in his maniac mode run. I will go one step further today and show you a two-turn clear of this map with only one rescue use. The arrive point is 43 squares away from the best starting spot, meaning Marcia needs to move 3 full moves and get boosted 10 extra squares to arrive in 2 turns. If we use a Sage or Bishop as our rescue user, we fall short due to not having enough deployment slots to have Marcia reach the particular square where she can drop the Sage and then they can rescue her forward on turn 2. Let's see what we can do. We have a lot of bonus EXP saved, so I decided to dump a lot of it on Mist to get her to 20.59. She was pestering me to let, get her more involved in the maps. The rescue staff was reduced to one use on the last map, so Mist repaired it again to go up to 20.99. Hey, wait a minute, what's going on here? I just said sages and bishops don't have enough move to rescue Marsha to the right square, and here I go having Marsha pick up Mist. She only has 5 move and can't even defend herself. Tormod hits C rank wind here, meaning he can use the blizzard. Renissa needs to be boosted a total of 7 squares to reach Marsha. Mist gets attacked, and what's this? She hits level 21, and will hence promote to Valkyrie. This will give her 3 extra move, meaning if she rescues Marsha after using her full move, she will grant her the 10 extra squares she needs. I didn't give Mist a sword, because she does not automatically equip it after promotion, so there's no point at all. Needless to say, the irons are frozen in place to let Mist and Raisin dodge all the attacks that will go for them. This little trick with Mist is exclusive to her, as the only unit who starts off as a foot unit and promotes to a mounted class, and being a staff user lets us actually leverage it to save a rescue staff use.
These lithium enemy phases are really dragging on. Top end of the green units over there is Joffrey, a pre-promoted paladin who uses lances and bows and comes with a paragon skill. He's not going to do anything for us in this playthrough. He joins at the end of the map. We had to drop Mist into position such that only one enemy would block her way on turn 2. This is so Tarmod can clear out her path with Blizzard. The village to the north of Tarmod contains the Savior Manual. We're not going to use it, but we go ahead and pick it up anyway. Turn 2 has Bastion and Lucia show up at the start. Lucia is a filler uh, swordmaster who can shove our staff users, while Bastion is another pre-promoted sage who wields knives. Lucia has the skill Parity, which ignores the effects of supports, other skills, and terrain in combat for her and her opponent, while Bastion has Corrosion, a proc skill to reduce enemy weapon durability. Bastion will get used for his ability to wield Siege Tomes in Chapter 28, and he'll show up as a shover on a few maps too. We'll clean up everywhere to finish Chapter 24 in two turns with one rescue use. Chapter 25 is the final route map of this game, colloquially referred to as the Eat Rock map. The hilly terrain of this map is difficult for cavalry to ascend, meaning this map is once more a foot unit and flyer show. We recruit Larjo through a base conversation. He's a berserker and he's just another infantryman shover to us. The gimmick of this map is that there are a lot of rocks which the enemies can roll down at us from the top of the hills, which do a flat 10 damage to all the units in their path. We will have to position our units to avoid them as much as possible, both because getting damaged is bad and also because we want enemies to actually suicide into us when we're in their range. There is also an iron ballista at the top of the map that would basically kill any untrained flyers in range without the foe guard, so we have to be careful with our positioning of Har. There are also a couple of onagers on the map, but they're not going to do too much damage to our units. Raisin doesn't take effective damage from the ballista when untransformed, but it still hits really hard and I'm pretty sure it one-shots him. We do a demi-band trade trick to boost Jill 4 squares. 
Jill will fly up the right path to clear the enemies there. By staying away from the road, she will not be in the path of any of the rocks. In an incomplete recruitment run, you would of course have to use Tanith for this job. Uh, this is kind of the map where Jill's capped out stats are uh, most shown off. After this map, she is just gonna be a filler mounted unit who clears out specific enemies. Masha carries Tarmod to the top to clean up the top area, since Tarmod still hasn't capped his stats. We shove Ike a couple of times, so Har and Ike can rescue drop Riss to choke off the left corridor. The Purge Bishop won't let us counter him on enemy phase, so we need to kill him on turn 2 player phase. Because of this map has strong self-preserving AI. If Tarmod had a tome that would let him cleanly wander on the boss, he would just attack Marsha instead. This is why we forged a max crit base my thunder tome all that while earlier in the run. Soren would do a better job of handling this job because uh, he could proc adept instead, but farming EXP is much more important than reliability. We switch over to the more powerful Thunder Tome Forge after killing the boss, so we can cleanly one round all of the other enemies for the rest of the map. Shade will ensure the other enemies ignore Marsha and die to Tarmod. Then with the salt, Ike does not cleanly kill the enemies with Killing Edge plus Aether, which is why they will choose to go for him over Riss, but he has decent odds of killing each individual enemy with the combination.
power contributes by picking off that sniper. We'd otherwise have needed to set up some kind of shock train or possibly burn a siege to amuse for him. Ship drops his purge stone, and this will let Riss join in on the siege stone fun in the later maps, and it's the whole reason to bother training him up instead of just having Soren be the rescue staff user. Marsha will cover a couple of enemies who won't die on enemy phase otherwise, with the help of Raisin. We'll just clean up and watch another long enemy phase to finish chapter 25 in two turns.
Chapter 26 is another seas map, this time set in a wide open field. We give Marsha an arm scroll, so she hits A lances, which lets her use the forged silver lance. We're joined in preparations by Alincia. Alincia is kind of an est, she is pre-promoted but has very low bases. She has A staves at base meaning she can use rescue, and uniquely she is the only flying staff user. However, all she will do in this run is to get Raisin into her saddlebags on this map to keep him away from the enemies. We have a lot of deployment slots, meaning we can pull off the longest shove train of the entire LTC here. The idea is to shove Riss as far forward as we can manage, and then have him rescue Marcia carrying Ike forward. Marcia will then drop Ike near the seas point. Raisin will dance for Marcia after she picks up Ike, so that she can actually drop him. We shove Riss a total of 9 squares here. Previously, the belief was that this was a map where Soren's 15 staff range would matter, but as I'm about to demonstrate, Riss's 14 staff range is sufficient for the 2 turn clear of this map. We did need to shove Raisin one square so that he could actually reach Marcia. Oscar, Kieran, and Jill just help keep the enemies away from our squishy shovers. Riss hit S rank over there, completing our little flex. Ike's Sonic Sword has been set to 100 crit, so he can keep the way clear on enemy phase. There isn't really much to say beyond commenting on the length of this enemy phase. At this point, we don't even care about farming EXP on our units. We just want to clear maps as quickly as we can and keep moving things along. Well, Ike at least grows some of his secondary combat stats, but given that Ike is not going to really be f handling the two stat check bosses in the late game, it's not super super important.
This is a cat proc from tool range. So Ike absolutely needs to crit that general in order, and also any bow using cavalry units in order to actually kill them. On turn 2, Riss will burn the final use of Hummer on Rescue, giving us 3 more Rescue Staff uses for the rest of the run. The Civil Lance we forged earlier was for this boss who is quite bulky and can also heal himself with the Rune Sword. Maybe with a Brave Lance double or possible triple crit, we could have beaten the boss without needing to give Marsha the arm scroll. That's chapter 26 in two turns. Chapter 27 is a two part chapter, with the first part being an arrive map. Most LTCs three turn the first part of the map in order to obtain the resolve manual, which is in a chest in the top left corner, spending a rescue use to get to it in time. We however will pass it up and instead 2 turn it with heavy siege storm usage. We will also need to do a lot of shoving and Tarmod's celerity is gonna prove significant. Celerity means Tarmod needs only one shove to get to one particular critical square to break open a door with uh, siege weaponry. This is what the 40 attack benchmark I mentioned earlier is for. The doors on this map have 40 HP, and only sages with bolting and meteor can hope to tear them down in one attack. Technically, Soren could proc adept, but we really do not want to waste our siege storm uses since we're gonna need to make heavy, heavy use of them uh, on this map and on the next map. Rista's magic cap means he cannot one shot doors, so he instead will pick off this general in the way. We go up through the right side because Tarmod had to take the best starting spot on the left to actually reach that square because on the right side that feral cat Lagoos is blocking his path. And as you're gonna see, we have absolutely no spare room to clear enemies out of the way beyond like the siege tome uses that we're deploying because we need to shove race in a whole bunch. Marcia needs to move 33 squares to reach the escape point, which is 3 full moves, or otherwise requires 1 dance. And obviously we would rather dance her on turn 1, where she's closer. Misha will once more rely on Shade to avoid enemy fire, though her Flame Lance is set to 100 crit to kill two enemies right at the end of enemy phase. She drops Soren to the right instead of forward because only then will the Longbow Sniper move further ahead to attack him and hence be within range of Riss on turn 2. 
While this enemy phase plays out, I can talk a bit about the Black Knight fight. With Aether and Mist to heal him, Ike can two round the Black Knight, which Typhoon Carter showed off. However, as was mentioned earlier, we are gonna skip the Black Knight fight and hence recruit Enna instead of Nasir. This is because of Endgame. The classic strategies for Endgame require Resolve, which we are skipping. We only have Wrath and Adept to use on our Ashnod killer. Ike with cap stats is one point of strength shot of killing Ashnod's first phase with a double crit. And as you'll see, Ashnod's first phase absolutely has to be one rounded. If we had Ike and Soren's B support, we could make up that point of damage, but I screwed up and didn't get it. The unit we get for beating the Black Knight, Nasir, does have better bases than Enna, the alternative, but he joins at a very high base level and hence does not have much room to grow. Similar to Ike, he will fall short of the benchmark to two shot Ashnod's first phase with crits, even with the energy drop. If we had saved both speed wings, we could have given them to Nasir, and then he would double Ashnod naturally, and the extra hit would make up the difference. Since neither Ike nor Nasir can one round Ashnod 1 given the state of my save file, we need to intentionally throw the Black Knight fight to recruit Anna. Anna joins at level 10, and we have lots of bonus EXP, so she can actually hit the stat benchmarks to kill Ashnod 1. If we had saved 1 speed wings for her, she would even be able to double Ashnod 1 and make the eventual endgame clear a lot cleaner. We needed to tear the door open to the boss area on turn 1, since we need to have Sorin and Marsha clean up the enemies in there in order to get the path clear for next turn. There are far far too many enemies in the way otherwise. On turn 2, Raisin is blocked in, so Morim will break him out by smiting rather than killing that cat since we don't necessarily need him dead, we just need him out of the way. There are two enemies plus the boss standing in Marsh's way to the siege point, and we will eliminate them one by one with our siege tome users, Riss, Tarmon, and Sorin. The boss of this map is really bulky and also has a really high lot stack. Even capped out Sorin with Bolting's innate 5 crit cannot pull displayed crit on him, so we have to punch through him th with raw damage. I could have either 2 shot him with Bolting, or as I do in this clear, I have Sorin proc adept and 3 shot him with Blizzard. Uh, this does burn 1 extra Siege Term use. But I figured that the bolting uses would be more uh, useful to have in the, uh, especially chapter 28. In hindsight, I could maybe have two shot him with Blizzard if I got rid of Adept on Sorin and instead taught him Flare. We'll just clean up to finish the first half of this map in two turns, and then Ike will promptly run away to complete 27 in two plus one turns.
Chapter 28 is the last Seas map of the game, and it is a doozy. There are plenty of enemy fear lagoos, and the enemy bulk has reached outrageous levels. We're joined by the much hyped Anna and Preps who will haul us over the finish line in endgame. Alencia cannot be deployed on this map, which makes this clear much more complicated, especially on hard mode. Looking at past English LTCs, Typhoon Carter 3 turned this map with 2 rescue uses and no deaths, while Cheeky 2 turned this map with 3 rescue uses and killing off Tanit and Riss in the process. How about we combine the best aspects of both of those clears and 2 turned the map with 2 rescue uses and no deaths. Ike now has his trusty Ragdoll, a powerful 1-2 range sword with some innate crit, and it will be his weapon of choice for the rest of the game. Given the crazy enemy bulk and the presence of lots of feral lagoos, Marsha's shade will not cut it for enemy AI manipulation, and we give Ike provoke for this map. We also deploy no less than 4 siege storm users. Much earlier in the run, I compared magic users to ballisticians in this game, and this map is the biggest example of that. The reason we deploy so many siege storm users is to snipe as many enemies near the starting area as we can on turn 1. In particular, we need to take out the sage with bolting since he would be in the way on turn 2. Jill has capped out strength and is using a max sport steel axe, and she's just barely killing the lagoos. Since Riss is busy killing enemies, Mist has to pick up the slack as our rescue user for the clear. This does help rescue boost race and forward with that position we gave him. I chose Bastion over Khalil because he survives being attacked by a feral cat at 1 HP, but I probably could have just blocked off the path with Oscar. Tabarn is present as an allied unit, but he won't do anything at the pace we're going. We need to boost Marsha 3 squares, so Raisin can dance from her from the correct spot. I could have had Ike chug a pure water to no-sell a sleep staff that's gonna go for him, but he just dodges, so it's okay. The combination of Provoke on Ike and Shade on Marsha seems necessary to get the enemies to actually go for Ike. We of course froze the RNs for Raisin and Ike's survival, which is why you won't see uh, all that many crits or ether procs at this enemy phase, even though you would normally expect at least a few. Ike only absolutely has to crit or ether one of the feral dragons who attack him at the very end of enemy phase, and the irons I chose do let him crit that, uh, crit those field dragons. Because we crossed into some reinforcement zones, there will be a set of three tiger lagoons who spawn in front of the boss. And these and the one stationary dragon who is already there are the big confounding factors for a two turn in hard mode. The only way to pick them off is to have a mage snipe them with siege, but the only tiles where they can be reached from are on the other side of the forest we flew over. This is the reason why Cheeky believed a flyer death was necessary for a two turn clear. The idea was to have a flyer carry a siege storm user across, die to drop the siege storm user on enemy phase, and then have the siege user kill off the dragon and one of the tigers with the help of Raisin. It's a reasonable idea to come to, but I'm here to show you that there's another way, one where everybody gets to go home.
We first need to clear out the enemies over here so Mist has room to maneuver. Jill, after killing that feral uh, Lagoose, needs to end turn on the square that it was standing on. Longtime viewers of my channel will know that the rescue staff can act as a budget warp staff in GBA games, and Tellys turns out to use a similar formula for calculating rescue staff destinations. The forest bends in a conducive way at exactly one point to let Mist rescue, bust, rescue boost Tormod past the forest, and with celerity he can take the two necessary actions on the opposite side of the forest to deal with the problem enemies to lock in the final new turn save of the run. Masha will then kill the boss to complete chapter 28 in two turns with two rescue uses and no deaths. On to endgame. We're at the denouement, and it's time I explain the mystery of Anna's Groats. The final boss of FE9 is ridiculously overstated, and he is near invulnerable to boot, since only very few units can even do damage to him, and the only way to crit him is with Rack. He's also basically impossible to double, only Anna or Nasir with Speedwing's investment can do it. The usual strategy to beat him is to use Rack with Resolve, but we of course had to skip Resolve. This is where Adept from 17-4 comes in, it acts as a budget Resolve by letting our units at least get a second hit in. We slap Wrath and Adept onto Anna and give her 10 full levels of bonus EXP. However, something to keep in mind is that Wrath only activates when below 50% HP and Anna is rather bulky as it is. If we simply had Anna at max growths, she would actually end up too bulky to go into Wrath range off of Ashnod's attack, so we had to set her defense and resistance growths to zero. Her HP growth is normally greater than 100%, so we could only legally set it to 100%. We give her the secret book and energy drop we had, and also give her both the Gemai Band and a Lagoo Stone. We need to pick off a few enemies near the starting area. You'll notice that my other units aren't getting perfect level ups. The tools for hacking Path of Radiance are kind of limited and one issue I ran into is that they failed to modify an already modified copy of the game. I didn't want to sit through and edit every single character's growths when Anna's level ups are the only ones that matter, so I just left the other characters at their vanilla growths. We pull out the last two Siege Tome uses we have to help clear out these particular enemies. Uh, we need to snipe at least one of them since they're going to be uh, in Riss's way. But getting rid of the other tigers means that like, we don't need to worry about Raisin's survival. Especially because we're going to need to lock the RNs in a position where Anna will get hit. And that would also cause Raisin to get hit.
Shoutouts to Mughal Boss, by the way. Their FE90% growth run is what inspired this little strategy I'm using with Anna. Uh, because I was afraid I would need to redo like a massive part of the run just to make it work. Transformed Anna has far too much bulk to be carried around, so we will use the final use of the rescue staff to get her to the front. I will upload a bonus video later showing off how the Ike version of the endgame strategy works by getting the B support with Soren with the debug menu. The reason Anna equipped the demi ban initially was to have 6 move to get to a square where Ashnot can one range her, and she will then unequip it and use a Lagoo Stone to transform since she needs all the stats she can get. Ashnot is mercifully sporting and will prefer to attack from one range even though Anna cannot counter at two range. Because of her HP level ups, Anna is actually still too bulky to fall below half HP just from Ashnard, so she needs to get hit by the Rexar Bishop first. I froze the RN since Anna needs to get hit and then Adept Wrath crit back, but as a side effect, she's going to get hit by a lot of low percent hits. Miracle does end up coming in clutch and saving her. The reason we absolutely had to one round Ashnard 1 is that only then on hard mode will we get a chance to call on and recruit one of the Lagoos Royals and they will only join the army on the next player phase after when they were called. Since this is a full recruitment run, we have no other choice than to one round Ashnod on enemy phase 1, so that the Lagoos Ryles will show up on turn 2. None of the Ryles are going to do anything in this run, so I won't really talk about them. Enna does 12 damage to Ashnod ahead, or 72 damage with a double crit, which is more than enough for Ashnod 1, but is just a little shot for Ashnod 2. So Ike will need to be carried forward to chip him down a bit. The Ladoos Royals can also damage Ashnard, but they can only fight from one range, and clearing out an enemy around Ashnard will just prolong the clear. It wouldn't be a Path of Radiance run without having one final absurdly long enemy phase, wouldn't it? As you can imagine, this was part of the reason I did not want to replay a large swath of the run to just do the Ike strat. Imagine sitting through all of these long enemy phases again just for what amounts to a minor flex. Thanks, Miracle. We do need to kill this one dragon who's standing in the way of Ike. And I will land the killing blows, wrapping up this playthrough. It's done.
Path of Radiance Fault Recruitment completed in 109 turns, for a total of 9 turns saved over Typhoon Carter's run. And it's also faster than Cheeky's old hard mode run and Mishina's Japanese normal mode run. I'm really proud of a lot of the strategies I came up with and I had a ton of fun uh, doing this run. I hope the viewer's mind was blown at least once. Toodles!